I'm going to talk a little bit about some just some of the academic research that we've been working on uh, recently. Uh, my, a lot of my research is on family controlled firms. Now everyone's familiar with the term family controlled firms, but it means something different to everybody. Okay? Many people, when you say the word family controlled firms, they think of the little kiosk on the side of the road or the little kiosk as you're driving by and it's somebody selling hot dogs or you know you go by the hopper store and you get a bowl of noodles from this person and you know, all the family members working there. Others, when they hear the term family firm, they think of some private, large private firm. Okay. Uh, but it can also represent a large publicly traded firm as well, and, or a medium-sized publicly traded firm. And the issue when we start thinking about firms that are publicly traded but that also have this very large dominant shareholder in the firm, one of the concerns that arises is, does the family or can the family exploit their power, their influence in the firm in a negative way to hurt the outside shareholders? Or do they tend to use their power, influence, and uh, ability in the firm to help the firm? Now, obviously, probably bits of both. And what we spend a lot of our time on research looking at is looking at very specific instances and saying, okay, in this specific instance, is family ownership a boom or a bust for the firm? Okay, so we might look at something like dividend policy, or we might look at something like compensation policy, or we might look at something like investment strategies, and try to see if family ownership has more of a positive or a negative impact on the firm. It's going to have both in various aspects. If we understand where it has positive aspects and where it has negative aspects, it's much better in terms of not only from an investment strategy, but it's also better from in terms of think of a regulatory policy. So I want to talk about specifically the notion of insider trading. Okay. Uh, now, insider trading is one of these odd topics that uh, people have very divergent views on. There's some people who think of insider trading as a good thing. Uh, and I don't mean just people doing the insider trading. Okay. And there are some people who think of insider trading as a bad thing. And when, a, when finance and when economists think about insider trading, they think about it first of what we have to do, we have to define it. And it's one of these odd things that is very poorly defined. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So what we typically talk about first is a more general statement about informed trading. Because defining insider trading can be somewhat tricky, but informed trading where someone is just making a trade in the stock market, or I guess in the bond market as well, on in private information that's non-public, that no one else has, we can definitely think of that as informed trading. Whether it's an insider doing it, the notion of what is or not an insider may differ among people, but it's clearly informed trading. Um, one of the reasons that the U.S. market is the most widely studied um, stock market is because that's where we have all the data. Okay, we have data on other markets as well, to a certain extent, but we have much better market on the U.S. data, just as um, an academic community around the world. So the SEC and market regulators all around the world tend to discourage insider and informed trading. Okay? Have lots of rules on uh, limiting insider trading uh, in terms of, for example, it's, it's illegal for officers and directors of the firm to short sell a firm that they are, they're invested in. Uh, but oddly enough, while insider trading is illegal in the U.S., um, it has been considered by the U.S. Congress on four different occasions where they've increased the penalties each time. It's one of the few crimes on the books that's not defined. There is no definition of insider trading, even though it is illegal to do it. That's a rather odd thing. Now, when they decided to pass the laws the first time, the SEC argued, don't put a definition, just let us decide. Okay. So think of this as an the analogy would be is if the police said, don't define what murder is, or don't define speeding, or don't define anything else, just let us define, decide as the police if something was against the law or not, or if they actually broke this law. So say speeding is a crime, and we'll define what is speeding when we see it. We know it when we see it. Okay? That's the insider trading law, and actually in most countries. And there's no legislative definition. So what we have instead of a law, uh, a law that defines what insider trading is. Since we have it illegal to do it, and you're going to prosecute people on it, we must have some, some kind of guidance. 
So what's happened in the U.S. and in many other jurisdictions as well is we've turned to court cases for precedent. Okay, so one of the very first ones was the SEC versus Texas Gulf in 66 that identified the notion that it's okay if you have private information, but it's not okay if you obtained it through someone breaching their fiduciary responsibility to the firm. Okay. So it matters how you get the information, not that it's private. In fact, in this court case, they actually said it's actually okay if you have private information. It just can't bend to a breach of trust, essentially. In U.S. versus O'Hagan, we have an update to that that says not only can you not have obtained it to a breach of trust, you can't steal it. So if the CEO broke the trust and gave it to you, that's the breach of trust. If you went into the company and stole the information, you misappropriated it, that's also going to get you for insider trading. Even if you're not, don't work for the firm, if you just steal the information from the firm, we're going to call that insider trading. And SEC versus Dirks, in this court case, they decided that we're going to call some people constructive insiders. And a constructive insider is somebody who we go, you know, they may not be an officer and director of the firm, but everybody kind of identifies the firm with them. Okay? And the way we're going to make that identification is if you own 10% of the firm, poof, you're an insider, even if you don't work for the firm. Just having 10% ownership stake, that makes you an insider. Not 9.99. 10%. So guess how most people structure their ownership in the U.S.? Right. Most family controlled firms, for example, in the U.S., you'll have four <coughs> family members. None of them will own more than 10% individually. They own 40% together with all four of them, or 39.9998. But as long as each of them owns less than 10%, they're good to go, and they're not going to be considered a constructive insider. But against this background, okay, we want to look at family controlled firms and look at insider trading in family controlled firms. Now, family firms are a prominent organizational structure. Now, outside the U.S., that's a widely accepted fact. I've been to several conferences in the U.S. where people have told me that family firms don't exist in the U.S. Go, okay, I guess Walmart doesn't exist, and Ford Motor Company doesn't exist, and you can just name them time after time. In fact, about of the S&P 500, it's about a third of the family third of the S&P 500 is family controlled firms. When you go to other parts of the world, it can be an even larger percentage than that. Okay. So this is a prominent organizational structure that matters. And there's really two um, incentives we can think about for the insider, for the family. One is they actually have a strong incentive to limit insider trading. One of the issues, one of the potential concerns with insider trading is that it has the opportunity to raise the cost of capital for the firm. Um, Many CEOs of family controlled firms who are family members argue that, for instance, you should ban short sellers. And one of the reasons they argue this is that short sellers are typically trading on private information um, that they think is negative, or they have this negative private information driving up the firm's cost of capital. In fact, one of the more prominent ones in the U.S. routinely goes on media shows, business media shows, and basically says things that like the short sellers should be not only outlawed, they should be whipped. Uh, they should be run out of town, and so forth. Okay. Um, it's, he makes very provocative statements to hear him. It's quite entertaining, if nothing else. Okay. Because he talks about it raises the firm's cost of capital, makes it very difficult for them to compete. On the other hand, though, there's another competing incentive, and that is that the families themselves have an information advantage. Often the family have several people who work in the firm, several people who don't work in the firm. The ones who work in the firm would be considered insiders and be barred from trading on this information, but the ones who don't work in the firm may or may, may not be considered insiders. <coughs> As an aside, when we look at SEC um, enforcement actions, about every year the, US, the SEC and the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission does about 100 enforcement actions, roughly, over the last, say, 20 years. So we're talking quite a few. And every year they go after things like hedge funds and CFOs and things of this nature, people you think of as finance professionals. Guess how many family members they have competed and had enforcement actions against over the last 20 years in the U.S.? One. Okay. So this prominent organizational structure, they've gone after one.